Thank you very much for this warm welcome. Thank you, Mr. President, for this welcome and for organizing this event. Thank you very much for moderating or trying to moderate uh, this section. I will try to answer questions on my side. I'm extremely honored and, and very pleased to have the opportunity of uh, such a direct exchange. That's the last moment of my trip, my state visit in the US, and after several official meetings, and an, this morning an address to the Congress, I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity just to directly answer your questions. So I don't want to make a long speech. I'm here for you. So please, no filter. Be direct. Whatever the question will be, I will try to answer. I will do my best. But thanks very much for being here, and I'm very happy to be in this uh, great university. Thanks very much, Mr. President, for hosting us and organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, allons-y. We'll start with this section. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Ladies, we'll begin with you. Yes, ma'am, the woman, the George Washington, gray t-shirt with the glasses. Wait for the microphone, please. Mr. President, I want to ask you about a global issue we care a lot about in the U.S., global AIDS. France has always been right by the side of America in effort to rid the world of HIV AIDS, not only in the discovery of HIV for which French research received the Nobel Prize, but also for turning science into action by laying the foundations for what would become the Global Fund and PEPFAR with its own Fonds de Solidarité Solidarité Therapeutique Internationale in 1998. My question is, under your presidency, how will France continue its leadership in ridding the world of the scourge of HIV AIDS? Thank you. Second question, gentleman from this section. Yes, sir, the uh, gentleman in the blue tie. Wait for the microphone. Please uh, state your name and your program. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Michael Ross. Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently a student in secondary education. Um, today, both of our countries are facing periods of unusual uh, strikes, strikes in the public sector. And so my question is, when, uh, in your opinion, Monsieur Président, is it appropriate for public sector employees, such as the teachers of the United States and the, the railway employees in France, when is it appropriate for them to go on strike, and what should the government response be? Merci. Thank you. Last question for this section. Is there a lady from this section? That will take this gentleman here in the, in the red. Hello, my name is Giancarlo Conti. I'm a political science student here at GW. Uh, my question is uh, in regards to Syria, and be it that President Trump has talked about pulling out of Syria. Do you feel like it is the French duty to get more involved and take a more leadership role in, in Syria? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, I will perhaps start by the second question, as the, the first and the third one were much more on the international side. I think, I mean, you're right. You can see several strikes and several situations which could be comparable in our countries. I mean, it's very different because the contexts are very different. First of all, I do believe that strikes are part of the expression in a democracy. So, I mean, it's normal, and I think it's good to have people expressing themselves, demonstrating, organizing strikes, if they want to defend their own interests, their own ideas. So I think that's something we, we built during our past, and it's part of our values, our democracies, and, and of the, the fact that we want to protect even minority ideas, because they can be, they can be right. So I'm very much attached to this, uh, to this right of demonstration and to the strikes, even for public services. If, because you mentioned railway in France, 
that's a very specific situation. Strikes are allowed. It's forbidden, for instance, for our defense people, our militaries, for obvious reasons. But it's absolutely um, allowed for people working in different public services, and it's allowed for people working in railway. Ten years ago, a law was passed in order to preserve a minimum service, which was, uh, in a certain way, an improvement for people when they need to take the train or the metro in order to go to, to work, and, and it was a very good decision. But now we have a lot of strikes and demonstrations because of the reform we are passing. The government is defending a reform. You have negotiations. You have disagreements. It will pass the reforms. You have strikes. That's normal. But at the end of the day, you will have a law passed at the equivalent of our Congress, and that's where the democracy decides. So my philosophy is that, yes, strikes should be totally allowed. It's part of the public expression for people. But it should not be the overall answer and the guidance of your action when you're a public leader. Because if you just follow people, and if you just, I would say, follow those who demonstrate, you don't implement your own policy, because it could be the voice of a minority. That's important to be expressed. That's not sufficient. And at the end of the day, laws are made at the parliament, and that's a good organization for democracy. So I'm a big defender of uh, the right to demonstrate and organize strikes, but I'm a big defender on, of um, clear and endorsed decisions in democracy. As for the two international questions, for and our leadership, we will definitely be totally committed uh, on this topic. I think, and I addressed this issue this morning at, uh, at the Congress, we're in the middle of um, a sort of a huge transformation of our current environment. We have a lot of uncertainties in certain regions. We have a lot of poverty in Africa with a very aggressive demography and with a lot of diseases all around the place. One of the results of this situation is instability. On top of that, you have climate change consequences with a big impact, especially in Africa. When you, when you look at uh, Lake Chad region and this part of the globe. And, and this, all this situation can create a lot, of, a lot of side effects for the rest of the world. So, the core answer to these challenges is development and international aid. So, yes, we will definitely reaffirm our leadership and we will increase basically what we invest. We will go from 0.37% total national revenue to 0.55% total national revenue. It was a big demand from the NGOs, totally legitimate. I decided to follow this demand and to increase our uh, investments. And we will invest in healthcare precisely to fight against the different viruses and diseases. We will focus on education. That's why we co-chaired with Senegal the Global Partnership for Education, and we reached um, a record because that's very important to educate people, especially in Africa, and to educate women. It's absolutely critical if you want to precisely develop the, the whole continent. And third, we will invest on agriculture and energy, because it's how to help this, all these continents and these countries to leapfrog and to make their own energy being green. They have solar energy, they have everything to deliver. So yes, that's a very important issue. That's an important issue for Africa and some other regions. That's a very important issue for Europe because we'll live the direct consequences of our inability to develop Africa. And that's an important issue for all of us. So we will confirm this leadership and reinvest. Because for me, that's not a classical expenditure. That's an investment. We invest in people. And that's a right to have this kind of investment. So we try to correct 
and initial inequality. As for Syria, I mean, the situation, and I spoke in the street with some of your colleagues demonstrating precisely against war in Syria, and I told them, I, 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 I'm with you, I, I'm against war in Syria. But we have to be precise and perfectly understand where we are in Syria and what we do. We have an international coalition in Syria making war against ISIS and terrorists. Why? Because they attacked us. In France, the Bataclan terrorist attack was organized from Raqqa by those crazy people. So that's the unique war we are making. No other. But at the same time, you have another war on the ground, a war from Bashar al-Assad's regime against his people. That's why millions of Syrians left the countries to Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Europe, US and Canada. And that's why we want now to preserve the international rule of law in terms of humanitarian access and because we want to definitely have the interdiction of chemical weapons respected. So what we are doing, and the first focus, is this war against ISIS. Your president said that he will stop the involvement of the, the U.S. troops as soon as the war against ISIS is finished, is completed. We are in the same position, and we increased our participation to the international coalition. We announced this increase this week. So our willingness is to be totally committed in this war against ISIS, no more than that. Second, if you listen to our press conference yesterday, he confirms that he wants to take Syria in a broader picture in the Middle East. And he is ready to get involved from a political point of view to fix the Syrian situation. And that's for me very important because our first challenge in Syria is not about war. We have to finish this war against ISIS. It's to win peace, to build an inclusive state to be sure that all the minorities, all the people in Syria will be entitled to live, express themselves and vote. And that's where our common leadership is very important with our allies in the regions and with the different parties and first of all with the Syrian parties. Because we, we should never forget that the one to decide for their own future are the Syrians. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll now go to this section of the room. Is there a lady from this section? Uh, yes, ma'am, in the gray shirt right there. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Merci de venir nous parler aujourd'hui. My first question is about the growing anti-Semitism in France. I'm sorry, France. just one question. Oh, this is my only question. There you go. <laughs> sorry. Um, my question is about the growing anti-Semitism in France, especially with the two recent terrible assassinations. What steps and precautions do you hope to take to protect Jewish citizens like my grandparents in France. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a gentleman from this section? Uh, yes, uh, Max in the back. Mr. President, thank you so much for coming here. My name is Max. I'm a student in the International Affairs Program here. In Ouagadougou, you stated that France no longer has a broad Africa policy. It's focusing on specific economic cooperation with countries. However, I'm curious what role France today has in dealing with human rights, good governance, and corruption in Africa, especially when the United States, which we used to see as a major player, is by, in many ways withdrawing from the continent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Max. Is there a lady from this section? Uh, yes, right here in the front, the George Washington sweatshirt. Right here, just here. Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Nora Mischler, and I'm a student of philosophy here at the George Washington. My question for you is, many of us, uh, many young people here have been inspired by your progress and the Republic en Marche, and I'm wondering, what advice do you have for us who might be frustrated by this uh, or struggling against a two-party system? Thank you. Look, as for anti-Semitism in France, and more broadly in a lot of places, to be fair, First of all, it's true, and we have to name it and recognize it. This is, I think you have two, two main roots of this anti new anti-Semitism. The first root 
is probably due to the a sort of importation of the situation between Israel and Palestine. And you have a conflictuality which reflects, in fact, the situation in the Middle East. And a lot of people want just to replicate, to mirror this international conflict within the French society. And the second route is um, a sort of an old French anti-Semitism, which existed at the beginning of the century and is resuming. That's a big concern to me. And we have to recognize it and we have to protect our Jewish people and to reaffirm every day that they are part of the French Republic. That's what I did in front of uh, the representatives a few weeks ago. And that we do every day by precisely explaining that, fighting against these ideas, and protecting Jewish people. You know, I often say that French Republic will not be the same without Jewish people. Because in my republic, Jewish people every Saturday pray for the French Republic. That's the specificity of our history. And perhaps we will revert on this very specific French relation with religions, but we have that. It's pretty unique. Jewish people pray for the French Republic. So we need them to be part of the French Republic. So in order to do so, what we, what we do is first, education at school, when the Minister of Education is in this room with me, we provide new sessions in order to train students, children, in order as well to train teachers, in order to fight against this new ideology and this sort of relativism or new hatredness, which is absolutely unbearable. Second, concrete security. We reinforce the security for Jewish community in France. And third, ideological battle and fight in order to explain and provide the evidence that the French identity is compounded by this national community made by all these different religions. And when somebody, on behalf of his religion, and because it just hates another religion. Can kill people. It just decides to get rid of the rest of the national community. And it's not compatible with the French Republic. It will take time. But we have to be inflexible. We have to be very tough. And I will be very tough on it. But anti-Semitism is an incompatible reality with the French Republic. As for a second question in Africa, corruption and the consistency of this, uh, this policy with different, this different governments. I mean, what you address with, the, with this question is a very well-known and very complicated question, which is how to develop your economic links with several states, governments, for, for people in, this in these countries. When you have, I would say, difficult governments, or people who disrespect classical governance, democracy, and so on. I think, first of all, when you are a Western leader, you always have to be very careful by teaching African people. It could be totally counterproductive. If you say, if you say I'm ready to make business with you if this, 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 they will say, whoa, why you would say that? Are you entitled to teach me? to explain what the democracy should be in my country and so on? That's a very tricky question. That's why international bodies are very much more entitled to do so, like World Bank, and it's part of the guidance they provide, and we follow them. And that's why I do believe that African Union is very important in such a scheme, because African Union is improving the level of requirement for the different African governments and making a very great job. Number of mandates, respect of the opposition, all these government aspects you mentioned. The question, it's a very practical question, is as soon as you recognize that the government is not compliant with these rules, even those of the African Union, do you stop making business with them? I think if this business is just a business for you, you should. If this is a business for raw materials, if it's a business just to have uh, your companies richer, 
It's unfair. But when making business and developing economic links means improving life on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you deal with that? That's why what we decided to do, and it's, it's, if you're interested, I, let me refer to the speech I delivered in Ouagadougou, where I explained that in details. Let's work with civil society directly. That's why what we experienced uh, for Sahel, for instance, is that we created this alliance for Sahel, and we said, we, are very, we have very good governments in most of this place, but we streamline the process, we work directly with NGOs and civil society, we gather all the different financing coming from the different governments and international subsidies, and we are faster, cleaner, and with an accountable process, because you have to assess what you do. If it's good for people, if you open I mean, classrooms, if you provide new services, if you provide electricity, water, it's good for these people. So it's good to, de to develop this kind of business. So that's my answer. I, I'm not here to teach the African leaders or African people, but the more we can streamline the process, work with the civil society, and follow the key pillars I mentioned, healthcare, education, energy, agriculture, the more efficient we are, because these three items are consistent with the third development in these countries. As for En Marche and, and, and my advice, if I may, for your generation, I was older than you when I launched En Marche. I'm sorry for that. But a lot of people from your generation in France and in Europe not just followed the movement, they made this movement. I mean, my recommendation would be you have to listen to your teachers first to understand this word, to have a sort of framework, and to build your own judgment. That's the main reason for you to be here at the university. And that's very important. For me, education is the basis. But never follow something which is not a lecture, but a sort of strong recommendation. My point is to say, your generation is the one to decide for itself. So you are here to listen to your teacher, but tomorrow, and even now, you are also here to take your own responsibilities. And when you have frustrations, because that's a word you mentioned, always question the frustrations. If they are, I mean, if you manage to understand why, for good reasons, you learn something. If you don't manage to find the right explanation for this frustration, don't abandon. Go further. And don't believe those who say, that's the rule of the game. Don't question the rule of the game. It's always been like that. You have to follow these rules. That's bullshit. <laughs> so if the deep reasons of these frustrations are not addressed by the explanations, by your teachers, by your political leaders, take your responsibility and make everything especially those who are, which appear as impossible. That's what we did. A lot of people in my country told me, you should not say that. If you are leftist, it's impossible to do this kind of reform. I mean, I, I told them, uh, look, I think it's fair. Why, if you are a leftist, you don't defend such a reform? And on the other side, some of the people say, if you want to attract the rightists, you should not behave like that. At the end of the day, I just try to push this idea that we can gather people from the left and the right to have a new progressive view for the country, trying to address this critical challenge of our current world on economy, on development, on migration, on energy, and so on. Everybody said it was totally impossible. But because people decided it was not impossible, we we made it. So, 
I just want you to, to bear in mind that the final choice is yours. And your generation will have a tremendous challenge. Your economic situation, the current inequalities, our planet, the current instability in geopolitics. We will try to do our best to provide some answers. But at the end of the day, you will be the one to decide. So if it makes sense in your country to build new initiatives, to gather all the progressists, if your frustrations are not properly addressed by your teachers, and sorry, Mr. President, for that, don't blame your teachers. Just consider there is something wrong in the system. And let's disrupt together the system. It's your job. So now I'll come to this section. There's a young lady here in the grace room. Yes, yes. Wait for the microphone, please. Please state your name and your program. Good afternoon, President Macron. My name is Shukri Deary. I'm in the School of Business. Um, my question is, um, your course of plan for Syria, for what you're aiming to do once you, quote, get rid of ISIS. Thank you. Uh, is there a gentleman here? Yes, sir, in the, uh, in the gray jacket. Wait for the microphone, please. Hello, President Macron. Thank you for being here, and we welcome you. My name is Walter James. I am a senior in the Elliott School of International Affairs. In 2016, the Dalai Lama made an official visit to France, but President Hollande did not meet with him, nor any member of the French government. Given Beijing's repression of Tibet and its persecution of the current Dalai Lama, who was exiled in India, and given France and the EU's positive relationship with the PRC, would you meet with the Dalai Lama if he were to return to France? Thank you. Thank you. A uh, uh, lady just here in the front, right here, in the, uh, in the red, please. Hi, my name is Hannah Radner. I'm a global comms master's student. And what do you think the future of the European U looks, Union looks like, and what do you want it to look like? Mr. President, and we'll take one more since the first question was very similar on the Syria question. Yeah. So one more question from a gentleman here. Yes, sir, please. Yes, the gentleman here. The gentleman is here. Please. Yes, thank you. Hello, um, President Macron. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, my question is, obviously, last year's uh, presidential election was the first time to... Uh, my name is Liam Gorman, and uh, <laughs> I'm a junior uh, majoring in political science and economics. My question is has to do with last year's presidential election. Obviously, it was the first time that two of the major center-right and center-left parties did not reach the second round of the election. Do you see that as like a fluke or as like a sign of sort of things to come that the sort of the French um, um, national political system is changing? Thank you. So first question with regard to that. I'm sorry, so, Mr. so I, I think I understand your question is, given the last election, because it was the first time that neither of the major parties of the left or the right won, will this happen again? Or is it simply uh, uh, by chance? No, but my, I, just to say, I have a conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> OK. As for the first question, I think I addressed pretty much your issue with my answer, but let me revert very rapidly on the Syrian issue. Indeed. I, I totally endorse the fact that we're making war against ISIS in, in Syria. And, and not just in Syria, by the way, in Levant. I mean, in Syria, in Iraq, and, and in the whole region. Why? Because these terrorist groups attacked our countries. They organized terrorist attacks in my country. They killed hundreds of people. And they are a threat for the security of the rest of the globe. This international coalition is very strong because we gather dozens of countries all together. And I think we are at, let's say, 90, 94% of the job on the ground. And we have to finish this war against ISIS. But because you 
provide me the opportunity to, be a little bit, to go a little bit further than your colleague. I, I just want to express where, or give my, vi my view about why we are here. We have a sort of a responsibility in the current situation. There is a crisis in the Muslim world, for sure. And you have now a fundamental Islam, which is rising, with very aggressive messages, which is totally the opposite of the original message of this religion. And that's something we have to monitor very carefully, because the big risk is to create civil wars in a lot of our countries. But on top of that, you had a lot of very complicated situations in the Middle East, sometimes because of our own, I mean, Western world's own interventions in Iraq and in different places. And they facilitated sometimes the acceleration of these terrorist movements based on frustrations, precisely. So, in this region, what we have to do is very, very tricky. And the core of the policy we have to organize all together is the following. First, finish the war against ISIS. No compromise with the terrorists, for sure. Second, we have to work with our allies and with the different governments of the region in order to stabilize the region and not to substitute ourselves to the sovereignty of any state of this region. That's very important to me. And that's why in Syria I do defend this inclusive approach in order the day after this war against ISIS to be sure that we have a new state in Syria which will be in a situation to represent everybody and respect all the minorities. Why? Because I think this is a unique condition not to have new terrorist movements suddenly being created from the ground because of the frustrations and because just one side, the current Syrian regime, will dominate the other movements, will dominate some other sensitivities of um, Islam, will dominate some other ethnicities. That's very important. Until now, we failed in this kind of policy. We, I mean, always decided either not to intervene or just to get rid of the governments and decide for the people. None of the situation, I think, is today the right solution. The right solution is to build, sometimes by specific intervention, like we did two weeks ago in Syria, without any casualties, but just to stop the regime with chemical weapons, and through a political approach, with people on the ground, with the different governments of the region to build this new order. I do believe in this solution and this part of this broader approach on Iran, I hope I convince your president to follow. As for the second question on Dalai Lama, I met Dalai Lama during my campaign in Paris, during this period of time you mentioned. It was a great meeting. He is a great leader, he's very inspiring and I do respect him a lot. Now, I am president of the French Republic. If I met him, if I meet him, it will create indeed a crisis with China. For me, I have two questions in front of such a situation. Do I help the situation for Dalai Lama himself? And is it good for my country? If tomorrow I meet Dalai Lama in Paris, Am I useful in order to fix the situation between Dalai Lama and the Chinese Republic? If I don't have any mandate from the Chinese Republic, if I don't discuss with them before, if I don't build the condition to have a useful meeting, honestly, it's useless. Is it good for my people? If I have a sort of countermeasures coming from China, for sure, no. So my answer will be, if France could be useful in order to fix the situation between the Dalai Lama and his people and China, I will do my best. I think these people deserve it and I think it will be good for China itself. And China is one of our great allies and China is a, is a great country I do respect. 
So my answer will be much more, let's work with China and let's try to be, if we are the right facilitator. I perceive some early signals that China, I mean, the Chinese president wants to move. I hope so. I hope so for China, I hope so for the Dalai Lama, I hope so for Buddhist people. But like that, without any precondition, just um, to provide a signal, I think it's useless and counterproductive to have a meeting with Dalai Lama in France tomorrow. As for the question about European Union, I mean, that's a huge question about the future of the EU. I'm a strong believer in the European Union. It was one of the core challenges of my campaign and is one of the essential part of my policy. Why? Because I, I, I do believe that given the current challenges we have, the European Union is the best way to organize ourselves and deal with these challenges. First of all, instability. We want peace. I believe in peace. If I look at Europe, if you look at Europe, look at our history for centenaries and centenaries. During the past centuries, we always experienced wars, I mean, almost every decade. That's the first time during 70 years we didn't get any war, thanks to the European Union. Because this is a very unique creation without any hegemony. Till now in Europe, we had a sort of um, broader organization, but based on the hegemony of one on the other. You had the um, Roman hegemony, you had uh, the Napoleonian hegemony, you had the Bismarckian, you had the, the Hitlerian hegemony. I mean, that's a series of empires. We experienced that. And it always failed because of the unbalanced future. European Union is unique because that's this cooperative construction without a gamony between the different member states. That's the very first time. So we have to preserve that. It's very important. And second, when you look at our challenges regarding digital, for privacy issues, to attract talented people, and get more innovation. When you look at our challenges regarding climate change, when you look at our challenges regarding migrations, developments, and so on, what is the, I mean, the right scale for sure the European Union? If I decide tomorrow to have my own green policy, my own digital policy, I don't have a relevant market. It's much more useful, it's much more efficient to have it organized at the EU level. That's why I'm a strong believer in the European Union to build a new sovereignty at the European level. I hope in the coming months we will manage to get an agreement. I do work very hard for that. I presented the French view, which is to have a sort of very inner circle with more integration and to propose a series of new policies to have a more democratic, united and sovereign Europe. I made these proposals last September in La Sorbonne, another university, based on culture, education, green policy, and so on. I'm working hard with our partners to convince them that now we have to design and come on a roadmap. In June, we have a very important rendezvous with Germany and all the other partners to build this roadmap, to fix the Eurozone issues, and precisely to propose a common future to all our people. My view is that we will have a broader Europe with less constraint, but the same rule of law. And the broader it is, the better it is. We will have, a fur, uh, I mean, I would say a second circle with a single market, with common policies, the existing EU with a certain level of integration. That's a level of new sovereignty. That's a market you organize for your digital, your green, your energy, and so on. And you will have a very inner circle with the same currency and a very strong integration in terms of labor market, in terms of corporate taxes, and in terms of education, and so on. That's my, that's my vision, but we are working hard now to try to have a common roadmap. 
this year. Next year will be a very important rendezvous, the other one, May 19. You will have the European elections to elect a new parliament a new, and decide for a new European Commission. And I will do my best in order to provide a very clear mandate to this parliament and this new commission. I mean, as I told you, I'm, I have a conflict of interest to properly address your question. I mean, you always need controversies. You always need differences and sometimes conflict, democratic conflict realities in the country to make basically vivid your democracy. That's why for sure you will have a series of oppositions. But the classical right and left opposition for me in, for France, and more largely for Europe, was no more relevant. Why? Because on the key challenges, migration, security, energy and climate change, digital, Europe, and so on, they were splitted. They were totally divided. You could be leftists being pro-European or anti-European, you could be rightist being uh, liberal in economy or conservative in economy. I mean, so it was inconsistent regarding the current challenges. What we propose is a new platform, a new ideological platform for progressists. So if I had to make it easier, I would say for sure you will have a strong opposition coming from the conservatives or the, and the extremes. And today when you look at the French landscape, political landscape. You have this progressive views that we defend. You have some conservatives on both sides and you have extremes. And that's probably, probably indeed the um, new orchestration of our political life. My view is that will last. But once again, I'm probably not the most neutral guy to come on that. Thank you. We have less than 15 minutes left. I will go to the lady here on the aisle. Hi, and thank you for coming here. I'm Madison Toronto. I am a data science student at GW. And my question has to do with the mass migration from, um, from the Middle East and Africa to Europe. Uh, we've seen over the years, as the mass migration has continued, an increase in terror attacks and assaults to the point that the London murder rate has overtaken the New York City murder rate. We've seen an increase in sexual assaults and rape of women to the point that many women are too scared to leave their house. And we've seen an increase in anti-Semitism anti to the point that in many cities, Jewish citizens are warned to not wear religious garb for fear of being attacked. And among a significant number, we Sorry, have may, may seen... May I ask your question, please? Sorry. Your interrogative. Um, okay, so given these threats, what will you and your government do to ensure the national security and cultural identity of France and Europe at large? Thank you. Is there a gentleman from this side all the way in the very back? Yes, please. Yes, in the back. Yep. Bonjour, je m'appelle Faisal Munajad. Je viens de l'Arabie Saoudite. J'étudie dans le Colombian College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, my question is, concerning the francophonie, you have stated that you would like the French language to become the number one spoken language in the world. What is your plan to achieve this? And with all the budget cuts, will you put enough resources to realize it? Thank you. Final question for the young lady here. President Macron, thank you so much for being here today. I am a student here at GW, double majoring in economics and international affairs. And my question to you today is in regards to the reform of the SNCF. You have proved your capacity to affect change in France because of your ability to hold yourself to your campaign promise. However, the strikes from the SNCF are providing to be difficult to overcome. Considering the hindering effects that the 1995 strikes of SNCF had on the presidency of Jacques Chirac and the 1968 strikes before these, how do you plan to succeed in your goal of reforming the SNCF and winning over the trust of these labor unions? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the first one, please, Mr. President. 
Oh, that's it. So if you'd like to address the first question. Uh, I, I, no, my, my question, do you want a fourth one? Do you want me to? If you want to take a fourth one, absolutely. We'll take this gentleman right here. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, hello, Mr. President. Um, uh, I'm Tony Tong. I'm an exchange student from the University of Hong Kong and studying international affairs here. Uh, my question is, uh, given the escalation of the U.S.-China economic uh, conflict, what will you perceive that uh, the role of France in mediating the uh, conflict between U.S.-China as a potential trade war will cause a serious and unpredictable um, impact to the global economy? So, Mr. President, uh, you're the head of state. I will respect whatever you want, but your people say that you have to be out of here in 10 minutes at 4.45. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> As for mass, uh, I mean, mass migration, I'm, to be fair, I'm not absolutely sure to share your assessment. I, I, I will explain why. I'm absolutely not naive. In our societies, we have a need for more security, more national security, especially for women, and that's why we are passing in France as well a very strong law against violence against women and against sexual, sexual harassment, because it's part of this lack of security for women you mentioned. And I already addressed anti-Semitism referring to the question of your colleague, I, I don't believe this phenomena are directly linked to this migration, this current migration coming from Africa. Why? Why? Because it's not brand new. Unhappily. We, we've had this issue for years, not to say decades, in my country. I mean, you were referring to Jacques Chirac. I, I, I do remember when Jacques Chirac was elected in 2002 for his second term. The core of the campaign was about lack of security. Exactly about the same debate. Exactly the same one. Anti-Semitism, in Napoli, we had the Murat's attack and the historic attack. It was, I mean, more than six years ago now. So it's not brand new, and it's not to be correlated to this migration, honestly. Not to say that there are, at the end of the day it will improve the situation, but what is at stake is our capacity to integrate people. It's key. For me, in our current, in our societies, referring to what you mentioned, we have two great issues in your society and in the French society. The first one is to build more fair societies in order to provide perspective and opportunities to our people. That's our responsibility as governments, but it's absolutely critical if you want to reduce the conflictuality of our societies. When you look at the neighborhood, when you have problems, riots, violences, it's very often because of the lack of opportunities. It's because we failed in our ability to integrate these people. And very often, when I speak about France, these people are the children of those who migrated decades ago. Their parents came for jobs. Sometimes they lost these jobs because of the crisis. And we failed, and we have failed to integrate them and provide opportunities. So that's one of the core reasons, and it's something we have to deal with through education, through labor market reforms, and transformation of the country. On education, we decided, for instance, to reduce like crazy the number of children in, in, in classrooms, especially in poor neighborhoods. That's very important, and that's one of the best options to fix this issue and to show them you have to be educated. And it's good because it will allow you to find your place in your society. Because when you are educated and you don't get any job because you come from this neighborhood, because of your, your surname, because of your religion, that's a failure of the overall society. So that's my job to fix that. It's not yet fixed. But that's a very important answer of the deep root of what you described. Second, you have to be very strict and very strong vis a vis this lack of security and this anti Semitism and this violence. Very tough. We passed a series of laws, we increased basically our policemen forces, 
We are now being much more strict on certain violences, like violences against women, as I told you. But that's, I'm very well known in France for the at the same time policy, en même temps. So that's at the same time policy. Education, fight against discrimination, and strong involvement on security, investment, and, and I mean, strong, a strong answer. That's what we have to do. This is the very first challenge we have in our societies. The direct consequences of lack of integration and inequalities. The second big challenge we have is about religion. Let's face it, and especially about, about Islam. We are in a, in a very new situation because this religion is in a certain way brand new for our societies. Our societies in the Western world were used to deal with Catholics or Protestants or Jewish but not with Islam, because it was not part of this region of the globe. But now you have to take into consideration that millions of people do believe in Islam, and they are your citizens with the same rights. And what I want to preserve in my country is the right to believe and the right not to believe. And I want free people. I want people to decide on their own their God, their philosophy, and the absence, or the absence of God for them. And today, there is an actual tension with Islam. Because you have tensions within this religion, and the Muslim world has to organize itself, when we have to help him. And you have tensions, because our institutions, our people are not used to work and behave with this religion sometimes. But that's one of the most important challenges we have in front of us. The right answer is not to refuse the other. The right answer is not to say, get rid of this religion. It's not part of us. It's wrong. Why? Because I think on both sides of the Atlantic, our national identity is based on free citizenship. We want to educate our people we want them to be in a situation to choose for them. I am not, as a French president, entitled to decide if you have to believe in this God or this God. It's not my job. My job is to be sure that you will be in a situation to freely decide if you want a God and whatever it will be. That's it. So that's why we have to deal with this tension, with Islam and with an Islam. But I think the best answer is not to refuse to face it. And the best answer is not just to reject those people. Not true. It's a proper answer. It's a proper answer is just to ask everybody in your country to respect the law of the country. And whatever the religion will, will be, if on behalf of your religion you don't respect my law, I'm against you. But you can believe in whatever you want. That's what we build. That's the deep roots of our societies and our citizenship. Finally, Regarding your, your question, I think mass migration coming from Africa are a challenge because they are increasing a lot of difficulties we have, but we have to face this challenge as well. First, by organizing ourselves for precisely try to define a line. That's very complicated. It's one of the, the most complicated issues when you are a leader. My view is that you can welcome people when they are in danger in the country. That's a duty. No discussion about that. Asylum is a moral duty. No discussion. So I want my country to be in a situation to welcome very rapidly the maximum of people entitled to, be, to get precisely accepted when they are at risk in their country. You have 
to look at the reality today, 90% of people coming from Africa are not coming to Europe because of this kind of political risks, but because of economic migrations. That's a very different situation, and I do endorse the fact that you cannot accept everybody, because that's not a sustainable burden for the French society. Why? Because we, always, we, we, are, we are ready to fix the situation you described, and the situation I tried to describe right now. So, we have to organize between the different countries of Europe ourselves to find the right rules and to block some people when they just come from economic reasons because it's impossible for our societies to accept everybody. The second very important point, and, and Europe is part of the solution, by the way, because that's the unique way to have a common asylum rule, that's the unique way to have a common regulation at the frontier, and, and, and streamline the whole process, and to protect our people and protect African people when they take risks. But the very, the very best answer to these migrations is linked to the first question you raised, development and international aid. I mean, the unique way to avoid this mass migration is to help these people to succeed in their country, is to provide electricity, energy, what, clean water, education, healthcare system, and that's our collective duty. And that's the best way. And you know, this discussion, and I'm sorry because I'm a little bit long, because that's a very complicated issue, and sometimes when you mix everything, you can make big mistakes. But this, this morning, I, I just quoted Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying that well, the main fear is fear itself. For migration, it's exactly the same. If we just took migration as a fear, and if we don't address the original causes, the deep roots of these migrations, we will entertain these fears. We will create more divisions in our countries. We will create more rejections, more conflicts, and we will never fix the situation in the origins country. We will never succeed. Our success will be precisely to help Africa to succeed. As for the second question, Faisal, for francophonie, and indeed I am a strong believer in francophonie because I think that's a very, um, that's a very unique language. Why? Because you, you mentioned francophonie and not just français. I always say that French people are very often the unique francophone just to speak one language. I mean, in the whole Africa, people speak French, Wolof, English, Swahili, I mean, different languages from their country or the region, plus French language. And that's why I, I, I strongly believe that's one of our assets in the current environment. The French language is always a language of translation being thought as something compatible with all other languages, a language of exchange, and a very powerful one. I think one of the weaknesses of the French language and francophonie till now was probably the fact that it was perceived as a sort of an instrument by, by France to dominate people or to have a sort of post-colonial approach. I tried in Ouagadougou to get rid of that, and I delivered a speech a few weeks ago in the Académie Française to try to present the new philosophy. I want this francophonie to be taken by Caribbean countries, Pacific countries, African countries. You know, the, the core of the francophonie today is not France. The core of francophonie today is the middle of Africa. It's somewhere probably around... Niger or Congo River, something like that. So, if we want to develop francophonie, we have first to encourage this country to empower themselves to develop this language. Second, we will invest in our schools, in our networks, in new way to teach French, and new way precisely to diffuse the French way to be, I mean, to learn. And that's the, the core of our education strategy, globally speaking. 
That's why I was so much excited by the Global Partnership for Education, and it's at the core of our development policy. I do believe that French language and French way to teach, French way to learn, is part of uh, this overall strategy. And I think it's very important, not just for the French language, because it can provide opportunities for a lot of people in the different regions of the globe. So I detailed in this speech in l'Académie Française a few weeks ago. You can go and, and see the speech. It's both in French and in English uh, 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 to see all the details of this strategy for francophony. Thank you very much for your question on SNCF. I, I addressed a little bit this issue regarding strife and, and your very sharp uh, and, and you know very well the French situation. Look, if you question if do you think we will overcome, just to pay my tribute to your Congressman Lewis, I was with him a few minutes ago, we shall overcome for sure. There is no doubt because we have to do so. I think the situation is very different from the situation you mentioned 22 years ago. 22 years ago, probably the French society was not ready to move. Today it's very different. The majority of people is ready to move forward. And it's part of, the, I mean, it's part of my election itself. So we should not consider that because a reform failed 22 years ago, it's impossible to deliver a new one now. What I want to do, what the government wants to do for the SNCF is precisely to modernize it and to have a much more first, a much more fair system because when you look at the situation with different sectors, it's unfair. To have a much more efficient system because that's a precondition to reinvest in this system and to make it as a role model for the whole Europe. So I think the rationale of this reform is very strong. The situation is much more mature than 20 years ago. We presented the reform, we negotiated, and we will deliver at the parliament. So we will overcome, for sure. Don't have any doubt about it. Because I think it's good for the country, because if I stop reforming the country on this issue, how do you want me to reform, to fix all these other issues? How do you want me to fix this, uh, uh, this very important issue your colleague raised? on security, on integration, and so on, that's impossible. If you want to do so, you have to be strong in this kind of situation, you have to be clear, you have to respect people. But for me, the strongest rationale is the fact that this reform is good for people working at the SNCF itself. As for the last question between US and China, I mean, I'm a strong defender of the World Trade Organization, as it is based on the rules we decided for ourselves. And I think when you are a global power, it's never good to say, I want to get rid of the, the rules I decided for myself. And the US, France, and a lot of other countries are the ones who created precisely these trade rules for everybody. I, I do believe that a trade war would not make sense. That's a message I conveyed to President Trump. That's a message I conveyed this morning to the Congress. We have, nevertheless, an issue, not with China, but with Chinese overcapacities. And this issue was recognized by China itself at the J20 a few semesters ago. And I think it was a very strong statement made by President Xi he recognized himself and he committed himself to deal with these overcapacities, especially in steel. So for me, the best way to fix the situation is first to avoid any escalation. Second, to be attached precisely to this free and fair trade philosophy. And third, to organize a fair treatment and a, a fair solution with China regarding these overcapacities. And everything I can do to help and facilitate, I will do. I proposed that to pr President Trump yesterday. I think he wants a negotiation with, um, with China. But at the G7 and at the J20, we will push this uh, cooperative solution 
in order to avoid any escalation. And France will def definitely uh, defend a cooperative approach on that, because I think it's, it's good for no one. I have a very last remark, if I may, Please. Mr. Moderator, before you, you conclude. Yes, because, but that's because of the flow of the questions. I, I just wanted to convey a message to you about climate change, because we speak about international affairs, we speak about immigration, security, and so on. We speak about, in a certain way, we address gender equality issues through the violence, but it's much, more, it's much broader, and it's part of the big revolution of our society. And, and your generation will have precisely to defend this gender equality. And, and it's part of your challenge. You will have to change that much more in depth. And it's part of the modernization of the society we will have to deal with. But I just wanted to convey a message on climate change. We have a lot of debates between France and the United States regarding climate change. I mean, it's not a, it's not a breaking news. Um, but whatever the decision of the U.S. federal government could be, we will have to deal with this climate change. We will have to deal with air pollution. We will have to deal with ocean pollution and all these issues. And it will be at the core of the organization of your generation. That's impossible to say, I defend the economy and the industry of my country. I don't want to listen to your message about climate change. I mean, it's, it's good for people having jobs. It's good for people living in, in perhaps in George Washington University or whatever. That's exactly the opposite. I think the first victims of climate change are poor people and poor regions. Just bear that in mind. The first victims of climate change today are some islands in Pacific. They can disappear in the coming years or decades. The first victims of climate change today are some regions in Africa because all the jobs are, ki are just killed because of this big transformation of the climate. The first victims are people living in poor neighborhoods because of the air pollution they experience. If your generation wants to give the choice to the next generation, you will have to fix the climate change, the air pollution, the biodiversity, and the ocean issue. It will be your duty. I, I mean, my generation will do its best in order for your generation to have the choice to choose. But it will be the duty of your generation to do the job and do to the end. And just bear in mind that if you want a fair society, if you want to avoid these big risks we mentioned, these new migrations, these new violences, these new frustrations, you have to build a fair environment. You have to bid a fair globalization. You will have to fix that. There is no other option because there is no other planet. There is no other humanity. We will do our best. And one of my objectives is precisely, precisely not to fix everything, but to give you the opportunity to decide for your generation. Thanks for that. Merci, Mr. Fogel. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it is yours. So always there, always do. You shall overcome. For sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to please keep your spaces until the president has had the opportunity to exit the room. Thank you very much.